Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I know we'll have a few more join, but we'll go ahead and get started and open up this webinar. Um, my name is John Bagwell. I work with Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, and this is the February presentation in our 2021 webinar series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. And we're very pleased today um, to have a, a new presentation that we've never had before uh, from the VCU Sustainable Pharmacy Project. Just a couple of announcements as we get started here. One is the total webinar will last an hour today. We'll have a, a presentation of about 30 or 40 minutes um, and then uh, take questions. And all participants are in listen only mode, uh, but you can submit questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A menu function in your Zoom menu. Um, hopefully you're able to find that. Um, that's an easier way for us to take questions rather than the chat box, um, but either uh, ultimately works. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started and I will turn it over to Dr. Samantha Adu, Chair of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Sam? Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining uh, our 10th webinar. Uh, 10th webinar in our series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. And I am so glad uh, to be that we're joined today by uh, members of the Sustainable Pharmacy Project. The Sustainable Pharmacy Project <clears throat> was founded and is led by students at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Pharmacy. The group formed out of a realization that the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals was a missing conversation. The student leaders are passionate about reducing pharmaceutical pollution. Today we'll, he we'll hear from leaders from the Sustainable Pharmacy Project, including Ladan Karim Nejad, who is a 2023 PharmD candidate and co-founder of the Sustainable Pharmacy Project. Kayla Pe Pangalinen, who is a 2023 Farm, uh, PharmD candidate and co-founder of the project. Kelly Pratt, a 2022 PharmD candidate who's secretary for the Sustainable Pharmacy Project, and Nathan Paul, who is a 2023 PharmD candidate, uh, as well as 2023 MBA candidate, and he's treasurer for the Sustainable Pharmacy Project. So it's my pleasure now to, uh, to hand the mic over to our speakers for today. Thank you, Dr. Atoot. So I'm just gonna share my screen to show you our presentation. So just give me a moment. All right, do you guys see it? I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. Um, I hope you all are safe and warm wherever you are, and especially hope that this presentation is helpful and informative. Again, my name is Kayla Pongilinen, a second year at VCU School of Pharmacy, and I'm one of the co-founders and presidents of uh, Sustainable Pharmacy Project. And today we will be starting the conversation on medication disposal, uh, particularly its environmental impact. And we will be addressing the following learning objectives. Um, one, identifying the various streams of how pharmaceuticals enter the environment unintentionally from the healthcare field. Two, review goals of medication disposal with a new emphasis on environmentally responsible healthcare. And three, explore the role of healthcare providers in medication disposal. However, before we jump right into the presentation, I just wanted to elaborate on Sustainable Pharmacy Project after that lovely introduction from Dr. Adhut. So we were founded in late 2019 during um, LaDon and I's first year at VCU School of Pharmacy. So we're still relatively new. Um, and while we are independent and student led, we do gain inspiration from other organizations, including Healthcare Without Harm, specifically their Safer Pharma campaign, as well as Practice Green Health. Um, so if any of you are interested, I highly encourage you check out those organizations as they are basically a great guide for us and great inspiration. Uh, furthermore, the mission of Sustainable Pharmacy Project is to educate future and current healthcare providers on the environmental impacts of pharmaceuticals in order to encourage positive change for climate action and improved patient outcomes. And one of our major focuses is medication disposal. So this is the Sustainable Pharmacy Project team. Shortly, you'll be hearing from Ladan Karim Nejad, of course, the co-president and co-founder, Kelly Pratt, our secretary, and Nathan Paul, our treasurer. And without further ado, I'm going to hand off the presentation to Ladan, who will be talking about how pharmaceuticals enter the environment. 
Thank you, Kayla. So let's start the conversation with the pharmaceuticals that are in the environment with respect to humans. So evidence of pharmaceuticals in the environment started in the 1970s when the EPA first published a report on pharmaceuticals and wastewater. And then in 2002, the US Geological Survey published another paper and the media took off. Research in this field started to increase. However, not all of the data was good data. So what makes it difficult to profile is that there are multiple drug compounds in the water. There's the metabolites that are active there or inactive, and there's unchanged parent drug and also new transformations of the drug once it reacts with other things in the environment. This becomes important to consider in humans if we think about concerns like drug-drug interactions or about how we don't use certain drugs in some populations of patients like pregnant or geriatrics, pediatrics, or those with renal or hepatic impairments. And so when this information reaches the media, another important thing to note is to let them know that the concentrations that are present are in the parts per trillion. This can be visualized as a drop in an Olympic sized pool. And so however, these concentrations are very low currently, the risk is that we just don't know what happens when we have these chemicals in our water for such long periods of time at such small concentrations. And also we don't wanna wait until the problem gets worse. And so some of the reasons for why we don't have this research, research available is that we just don't have the analytical methods that are necessary to figure out or identify these compounds in the water. And also this is incredibly resource and cost intensive. The sheer amount of compounds in the water is, is also another aspect that's really um, hindering the research. And so in here, I want to present a study that was conducted from the by the EPA in 2014. Um, they collected samples from 50 large wastewater plants in the US for 24 hours. And in this table, I'm presenting to you um, what they found. And so they found that hydrochlorothiazide was present in all the samples that were collected and valsartan was present in the highest concentration of all the samples collected. And in this table, I want to show you um, their concentrations that were compared to doses per decade. What was defined as a dose per decade was under the assumption that a person drinks two liters of wastewater per day. And that's not realistic really, but it was used to kind of compare where we're at because we drink drinking water. <laughs> and it was found that listener flow was found to, to be able to produce one dose per year. And so if we think clinically, Initial concentrations for starting lisinopril for indications of hypertension is usually five to 10 milligrams daily. And in 2017, um, the UN named antimicrobial resistance or AMR to be an emerging environmental concern. And here in this table, the study was measuring concentrations they measured in the environment compared over minimum inhibitory concentrations and so ratios that were found to be closer to one were associated to potentially inhibit beneficial bacteria growth and potentially facilitate faster development of clinically significant resistance in patients who are already on treatment. However, on its own, it's very unlikely. And so in here, you can see that olifloxacin and ciprofloxacin were the two antibiotics that were found closest to one in a ratio. Another example of AMR is the pharmaceutical pollution crisis in Hyderabad. Hyderabad is a city in India that's bordered with many pharmaceutical manufacturers. And actually, India and China produce most of the generics in the world. And so due to the high industrial affluent from manufacturing, the natural landscape of this community has been drastically affected. And below you can see an image of dead fish um, washed up ashore. And so the inappropriately and untreated managed, managed west, wastewater has polluted the waters with heavy metals and industrial effluents and solvents. And that has resulted in toxic, toxic foam, dead fish and high levels of antimicrobials in the water system. And these are the water systems that the communities rely on the most. And then if we go beyond humans and we think about wildlife, um, the unintended effects of pharmaceuticals and wildlife has, is lacking attention. And so the first report of synthetic estrogens affecting reproductive systems of fish was published in 1999. And then locally in 2003, scientists found evidence of intersex fish in the Chesapeake Bay. And they followed these populations and found intersex fish all along the Shenandoah and Potomac River systems. And so the discussion started to surround around steroids and endocrine disrupting compounds. And these affect the normal reproductive systems of these animals. 
Another dangerous and important aspect to think about is drug accumulation. This is important because there's many consumers of fish. And already, if we think about how mercury levels have reached hazardous ranges for years now, if um, they're also accumulating drugs, then this really questions the safety of consuming fish. And so I know what we're all thinking. It's why don't we just take these drugs out of the water? Well, relying on wastewater treatment for complete removal of these compounds is not feasible. So prevention is, an, prevention is another controllable measure. We can reduce the discharge into the environment and limit drug exposure to drinking water and aquatic ecosystems. So now that we talked about what's present, we can talk about how it gets there. <laughs> so once pharmaceuticals enter the environment, they're very hard to remove. And so these small molecules are very potent and they like to bind to things like water or things that are organic. And so some of the most significant ways pharmaceuticals get into the water is through patients excreting unchanged drug, which is how most of the drugs are excreted. Other household entryways are when patients stockpile medications that are unwanted, unused, or expired. And that could be disposed of, disposed of in the toilet, sink, or trash. And so when they're thrown in the trash, it ends up in a landfill, and the landfill leachate eventually ends up contaminating the water system and the soil. Also, hospitals and large healthcare facilities produce a lot of waste. Pharmaceutical waste is the largest, most difficult, and most expensive type of waste to remove. And so improperly or improperly or inadequately managing the hospital waste can lead to unintended pharmaceutical pollution in the environment. And like we talked about earlier, manufacturers are huge stakeholders in pharmaceutical waste. And so because they have many types of pharmaceutical plants around the world, they follow different degrees of environmental regulations. And so this could lead to exploitation and disproportionately affecting populations and species of that area. And also, it's important to consider that all these streams eventually lead to the water that's grown, that's used to grow and make food. And so the pharmaceutical cycle continues via the soil, the water, plants, animals, and people. Awesome, now next slide. <laughs> cool, so common medication waste. So numbers of tablets and capsules are definitive. However, certain formulations like topicals, creams, and liquids are more difficult since they come with, they usually are dispensed in manufactured containers. And here I have a picture of amoxicillin. Amoxicillin, for example, is often prescribed and dispensed as a reconstituted suspension, usually for patients that are pediatric, geriatric, or have an aversion to swallowing. And it comes in four strengths, and depending on the length of use, which is usually like 10 to 14 days, it usually leads to leftovers. Another important aspect is controlled medications, like opioids and stimulants, um, because medication disposal is really highlighted through a drug diversion standpoint through the efforts from like the DEA. And so controlled medications like opioids and like particularly opioids, um, people don't feel comfortable keeping them around. So they're commonly disposed. Medical devices like inhalers, um, those are very difficult to dispose of because they have multiple components. You have the actuator, you have the canister. And so when a patient's out of their doses, they usually have to get a new device. And so without a way to maintain the integrity of the device, it becomes waste. An important way to limit um, pharmaceutical waste is to limit PRN or as needed medication. Some benefits of doing so include um, include reducing the overall waste of the patient of waste of the medication if the patient is not going to use it. So you're reducing the amount of unwanted or unused medication. Another way would be to ask what the patient already has, and that could reduce healthcare and patient costs. And also by reducing the amount of drugs at home, there's less risk for accidents, like children accidentally taking drugs or decreasing the patient's pill burden or confusion. Um, a big benefit is also that patients can interact more with their providers if they need to. However, that could also be a big con if accessibility is a problem. Also important conversations to have um, at the office or at the counter to reduce waste would be to ask um, if the patient has either the medication or an equivalent um, effective equivalent at home that's unexpired. Prescribing smaller packages and asking if having more refills is okay is also great at reducing waste. And it could also increase patient provider interaction. Um, and also offering general information on what to do when they have leftovers is very important. And now Kelly is going to talk about proper medication waste disposal. All right, so what does proper medication disposal look like? So the DEA hosts national drug take back days where you can return your unused and expired medications. However, it only happens about once or twice a year and only at limited locations. There are permanent disposal bins located in pharmacies, fire stations, and medical facilities. 
Unfortunately, all the medications that are collected from these bins are in the end incinerate, incinerated. So although it does, create, uh, does reduce uh, drug misuse, it still creates pollution. And if we take a look at the US FDA disposal guidelines, it informs patients to scratch out any personal information to combine the medication with a bad tasting substance such as ground coffee or uh, kitty litter, to place it in a plastic bag and to throw it in the trash. Or you can also check the FDA flush list, especially if it is an opioid, and that's just to prevent um, anyone else getting a hold of the medication. So in 2017, the FDA published a report discussing the environmental and human health risks associated with flushing certain medications. Although they did determine it to be a negligible risk to the environment, they did note that more data would be beneficial to confirm these findings. And as Ladon had mentioned earlier, there are many uh, metabolites and other compounds um, once medications enter the environment, especially the waterways. So there's really a lot of unknown behind uh, what medication um, impact looks like once it's in the environment. So I wanna introduce this term to you, eco-unfriendly, and that's referring to disposing of medications in a way that is detrimental to the environment. So this graphic is from the FDA website and it just depicts different ways to dispose of your unwanted medications. So on the right-hand side, you see there's an option to go to a designated take-back location. So the patient has to take the medications and travel to these locations at a certain time period or in a certain region. However, on the left-hand side, there are two options to simply throw away the medications or flush the medications I, as I had talked about. So this might be a more simpler option for some patients who either don't have accessibility or just for convenience. And as humans in society, what decisions are actually being made about our drug disposal? So there was a study published in January of 2020 that reviewed 48 surveys reported by peer-reviewed literature from 34 different countries about the average disposal methods of medications. And the result of this was that 72.7% .7 disposed in an eco-unfriendly route. And this included garbage, sewer, and burning medications. And they also noted that higher HDIs, or health development measurements, coincided with higher rates of eco-friendly disposal, which included recycling or returning medications. Countries that have a higher HDI are associated to have um, individuals with a longer, healthier lifestyle, those that might be more knowledgeable and have a higher standard of living. So this might make sense to us because they might have more resources in their communities and just have more knowledge um, about medication disposal in general. So uh, to know there are some countries such as Australia, New Zealand, and England that reported about 25% of their medications returned and burning medications was more common in other countries such as Sudan and Ethiopia. And to focus on the U.S., in 2014, over 60% of participants denoted garbage as disposal method for their survey, from the survey. So as we try to understand why this number could be so high, we can take a look at a meta-analysis that dives into the attitudes and behaviors behind medication disposal. There are a lot of statistics on this slide, but what we, what we can see from this is that most individuals are aware of what is right and wrong. And this meaning that they are aware that the right thing to do would be to return their medications to the pharmacy and it's probably inappropriate to flush or dispose of their medications in the trash. So although a majority of individuals knew that this was the best way to dispose of medications, almost always a majority of these people chose an eco-unfriendly way instead. So instead of focusing on why people may feel this way right now, I wanna go over why this hasn't changed. So overall, medication disposal is just a stagnant area in healthcare. And the biggest reason why I believe um, is that because today there is a lack of proper recycling and prevention of excess waste in the medical field. This is a challenge because when you consider um, patient safety and uh, limited resources, um, and, you know, it's hard to focus on preventing medication waste. However, there are many unexplored avenues um, in preventing this waste. And I think that also stems from a lack of public awareness and possibly accessibility around medication disposal. I think a lot of individuals may not be familiar with uh, how to actually dispose of unwanted medications. In pharmacy school, we've been taught that there's overall limited innovation in pharmacy, which may be why we haven't heard of many new ideas around this topic. And as pharmacists, uh, we aren't usually trained on how to counsel patients on medication disposal, at least personally, 
I have not learned that in school yet. And so this may suggest that overall there's a lack of healthcare provider training across the board uh, where we're not taking the time or we don't have the knowledge to educate our patients what they should be doing with leftover medication. And the smallest but perhaps most yielding factor is lack of financial benefit. As LaDon had mentioned, um, these initiatives are very expensive, especially trying to remove um, a waste in the environment. And um, this can obviously just dampen the desire to put money into this um, since it is, you're not getting a lot back in return. So what does innovation look like for medication disposal today? Before I get into that, the World Health Organization recommended in 1999 that expired or unused pharmaceuticals should never be reused. And this is primarily because, primarily because of patient safety and liability concerns. So now over two decades later, is this a stance we can revisit to see if we can have an impact on medical waste? Well, there was a study that did just that. In 2014, there was a Dutch cross-sectional study where patients return medications over the span of one week to 41 community pharmacies. And the medications that were returned were classified as preventable waste if the remaining amount could have been prevented from being dispensed and as theoretically eligible, eligible for redispensing if the package was unopened, undamaged, or greater than six months and greater than six months from the expiration date. So the, res the result of this was 9,538 US dollars returned of medications with over one third preventable waste and one fifth eligible for redispensing. There, the limitations of the study was overall low value of the medications returned and potential improper storage. And this is important to think about because as I said, um, this ties back to low financial benefits associated with med disposal as well as potential safety concerns from redispensing medications. And it's interesting because other studies have been conducted to assess patients' acceptance of being dispensed reused medications. And although this idea of reusing medications in healthcare is fairly radical, I do think it is thought provoking. And so in the pharmacy, as soon as medications leave our site and the patient leaves the pharmacy, we can no longer ensure quality and safety of the medications. So knowing this, what can we do instead to prevent this excess pharmaceutical waste? So luckily, medication disposal has not always been 100% stagnant. In Turkey, for instance, a private communication company saw great results after training their staff in proper medication disposal. This is a great example of how public awareness and training can pr produce great results. Imagine if 60, over 60% 60 of individuals were returning their medications to the pharmacy instead of throwing them away. That would just be really great. And in France, there is an issue where the public was underutilizing established medication recycling services. And to fix this, non-governmental entities created pictograms for manufacturers to place on the drug leaflets in boxes. And this explained how and where they can recycle their medications. They also started a commercial campaign in community pharmacies to get the word out. And pivoting to the United States, um, back in 1986, the DOD teamed up with the FDA to start the Shelf Life Extension Program. And what this did was it tested a series, a bunch of medications to test the, um, the shelf life of the medication. So the result was an average extension period of five and a half years of shelf life for over 122 different drugs. So the expiration of date that was determined on the medications when they tested them, um, chemical, the, the stability of the drugs was still acceptable for patient use. And so the thought process behind this is, can we use technology today that will allow us to continue to safely extend the shelf life of medications in hospitals, pharmacies, and even in the patient's homes? So what are some of the barriers we are seeing today? And now Nathan's gonna talk about that. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, can you just confirm that you can hear me really quick? I just want to make sure. Great. So scrolling through the participants, um, there are obviously a lot of VCU students here, which is great. There are also some people from across the United States, California, uh, Wisconsin. We have people from Canada and even Africa. So just so you guys know, um, we had an ice storm pass through Virginia um, last night. So if our co connection is a little bit wonky, you know why. But anyways, back to the presentation. So 
um, barriers to disposal. So you may be asking yourself, why doesn't everyone dispose of their medication correctly? It just seems like the proper thing to do, right? Um, unfortunately, there are some pretty big barriers. Um, the biggest one being cost. So the Virginia Board of Pharmacy actually met virtually this past um, July to discuss a tentative agenda of drug disposal. And one of the topics was take back programs. So they evaluated the cost of take back programs and on average um, around a cent for every $10 in pharmaceutical sales is what it costs. Um, and obviously this starts to add up. Um, another barrier um, to cost is the idea of a Virginia statewide program. And this was actually one of the major topics of discussion um, in that meeting. So um, if all DEA authorized collectors participated in a program of this nature, it would cost anywhere from three to $5 million to fund. Um, and ultimately, the idea of a statewide program was shot down for that major reason. But another reason is that the statewide program just didn't have um, enough evidence on actual reduction of pharmaceuticals um, in the environment. So um, cost is a big one. Another one is time. So organizing for take back days um, for providers. Um, if a statewide program were to pass, kind of adjusting um, uh, to that would take time. But even now, day to day, many providers still consider the options for proper disposal to be a cumbersome process. Um, on the other hand, for patients, interactions with law enforcement, that's a big one. So many law enforcement agencies have drop-offs. Patients may not want that type of experience for a myriad of reasons. Uh, medication history. Um, so medication history is information that should be kept private. And patients sometimes feel uncomfortable taking back medications, even to their pharmacies to drop off just because of privacy concerns. Um, further than that though, where to even locate that information? Um, what are they, where are the expiration dates? Uh, where do I go to dispose of the medication? Um, transportation, especially in lower income areas or for patients that just don't have access. So that's another barrier. And mail-in programs um, is one solution, but these programs are also normally state run. So, the biggest one, though, um, is lack of information on impact. So uh, patients, when they view, um, you know, their impact, they can't really see it. It's invisible. Um, the benefit that they're making on the environment is unseen. It's easier to just throw away or flush medications, too, um, especially when you don't have, um, you don't feel like you have this uh, kind of consequence. So. Onto the roles of healthcare uh, professionals. So pharmacists, um, counseling on medication disposal at the counter. I think drug disposal should be built in um, to counseling for pharmacists. Uh, it's, it's kind of um, completes the circle of information for patients. Another one is advertising disposal services available. Um, so many community pharmacies have available pharmacy, uh, available services, including Walgreens, CVS, um, even some home pharmacies. So letting patients know about this is really important. Uh, and then discussing reimbursement opportunities. And on the other side, we have providers. So limiting, limiting PRN medications, and Ladon previously spoke to this, um, just having less of a pill burden. Um, so prescribing smaller packaging um, with refills as needed and um, emphasizing preventative and non-pharmacological therapy. Um, if you can avoid giving medication to the patients in the first place, this is always preferred. Um, patients, so shifting the way that patients think. Um, first of all, increasing awareness of the role of patients in pharmaceutical waste reduction, um, kind of shooting down the idea of invisible benefit uh, and encouraging patients to contribute and connecting the bridge between behaviors and attitudes. So um, including medication disposal in the conversation of environmental consciousness is so important. It's something that is definitely overlooked. Um, and it's, it's definitely a movement that I think is building right now, um, environmental consciousness as a movement, but medication disposal shouldn't be overlooked in that movement. Um, and manufacturers, so 
increasing the responsibility and accountability of manufacturers would play a huge role um, in mitigating pharmaceutical pollution. First and foremost, they have the capital means to do so. Um, so putting this responsibility on patients and healthcare workers is a lot and redirecting that pressure to where um, the source where it's coming from uh, would be useful. Um, so the NVWMB, which is the North Virginia Waste Management Board, uh, conducted a survey um, a few years ago, and it found that localities are spending approximately $3.6 million annually to properly recycle or dispose hard to handle materials. And more than 84% of those jurisdictions wanted to see manufacturers take more responsibility for recycling or disposing of difficult to handle materials in Virginia. So as you can see, it's not really this up to debate topic. Um, one program was GSK's Complete the Cycle program, and we'll touch on that in a little bit on the next slide um, about an actual uh, manufacturer led take back. Um, but some other topics to quickly touch on with manufacturers. Um, environmentally relevant testing. So um, basically the idea of testing products um, at lower doses or at chronic doses um, can really help, um, our, those, those products are a lot more environment, environmentally friendly than higher dose products or even acute um, treatments. Um, encouraging reverse distribution. So reverse distribution is the return of expired or unused pharmaceuticals to manufacturers in exchange for credit um, instead of consigning them to immediate disposal. So encouraging programs like this, uh, manufacturers have that ability to do that, um, especially when manufacturers don't wanna take that responsibility upon themselves. Um, and the last point I wanna to touch on is green chemistry. So the idea behind green chemistry is instead of ending up with toxins that must be treated um, and contained after the fact, uh, aiming to create industrial processes that avert hazardous problems altogether um, while still creating solutions. And looking deeper, um, and Ladon also kind of touched on this earlier, but um, innovators should start to focus on designing drug compounds that reach the site of action, exert the effect, um, and then lead to inactive excretion. So GSK's Complete the Cycle. Um, just wanted to touch on this really quick. Um, and it, basically, uh, GSK in the UK specifically, um, I wanted to make that clear. Um, they led uh, an initiative for inhaler retriever, retrieval in 2011. And just some background on um, inhalers for uh, patients that are also on this call. So. Um, Meter dose inhalers, um, or MDIs, uh, used to contain ozone-depleting gases, specifically uh, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, um, and they functioned as the propellant to drive the medication um, or to deliver the medication to the patient. Um, and in the 1990s, those meter dose inhalers um, were replaced with either dry powder inhalers or MDIs containing hydrofluorocarbons. And so HFCs, and while those are not ozone depleting and definitely more environmentally friendly, they are still potent greenhouse gases. Um, so in 2011, GSK um, launched a program to take back inhalers, and this ultimately led to the recovery of over 2 million inhalers. Um, and for some reason, the program was shut down this past year in September, which is a shame, um, and other alternatives were proposed by GSK, specifically switching to um, DPIs, um, which are uh, more environmentally friendly, but at the same time, DPIs um, are quite poor for patient adherence um, and delivery compared to MDIs. Um, so this could have been a golden opportunity for GSK to encourage other manufacturers in following suit, um, but instead they ended the program with the statement that we believe there needs to be a focus on a wider joint working approach across the industry rather than our own standalone approach. Um, so the potential was great. Um, and the, the power that GSK holds and held um, 
could have really been used. Um, but it really begs the question as to why the program was stopped. And so this next slide um, talks about EPR laws. So EPR laws require manufacturers of products um, to be responsible for its ultimate recycling, uh, reuse or disposal. Um, and it has become um, a significant waste management option in recent years um, in the efforts to increase recycling and landfill diversion rates. Um, so you can see on this, on this map, the areas that have higher um, EPR laws. And as you can see, California, Maine, Vermont seem to be um, pretty concentrated, but um, the rest of the United States um, could definitely use some more legislation. Um, and last, these are some resource, resources for you guys to um, explore. You can actually sca scan these QR codes and they'll take you directly to the source as well. Um, but safe.pharmacy slash drug disposal and search.earth911.org. Um, both of these guide you on how and where to recycle at your nearest location. All you have to do is type in your zip code. You can even search specifically what you want to um, target in recycling. Um, and it'll take you to your nearest location. I'm just gonna pass it on to Kayla for some closing remarks. All right, thank you, Nathan. Um, so to wrap up the presentation, I just wanted to reflect on some future implications for medication disposal. Um, it's important to consider that there's still so much to learn and to accomplish, um, but here are some elements that we can try to address and improve upon. Firstly, being awareness. And um, part of awareness is, you know, as an organization, uh, we strive for optimal medication safety. And of course that includes what people usually think of like decreasing drug diversion, but we want to encourage everyone to expand their idea of medication disposal to include environmental responsibility. And uh, another part of awareness is just public education, which can be facilitated very effectively by providers. Um, this can include counseling on proper medication disposal and referring to resources like many of my colleagues mentioned before, but this can also be a way to empower your patients to take control of their health by participating in the disposal process. And this could even lead to a discussion about a green future in healthcare. Um, another uh, element that I wanna talk about is advocacy. Um, so a lot of healthcare providers, we know based on our training in school about topics like um, acquired resistance and drug accumulation. And some providers might even have a great idea and great ideas, um, solutions to how to tackle this medication disposal problem. But we can't get that to come to life without the help of legislation. So a way that we can get this accomplished is to support legislation that can hold manufacturers accountable and increase transparency, uh, to push for reimbursement for disposal services, and to advocate for counseling to become part of um, counseling on disposal to become part of uh, curriculum in schools and as part of regular practice in your healthcare systems. Also, um, another thing is to advocate for changes in packaging so that instructions on disposal are included by the manufacturers. And lastly, research is another element that I want to reflect on. Um, so there's much to learn about the problem, as I said earlier, but this provides an opportunity for interprofessional collaboration to identify the gaps in our knowledge and to learn how to make disposal more efficient. So I want you all to reflect um, on what is the best way that we can educate the public? How can you incorporate some of these into your practice? And of course, again, we want to reemphasize that we are all about interprofessionalism um, and we are growing as an organization and we want to connect students and professionals to make a difference in the field of environmental health care. So, um, we want to basically just work together and make a green future and healthcare accessible and realistic. And to leave with some final thoughts, um, we just took some excerpts from some of uh, our research. The first quote is from the Hyderabad pollution crisis, and I'm just going to read the bolded part. We have been systematically denied the very basic things required for life, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. Um, and the second excerpt um, is from the water studies with the feminized fish. So everything we do, everything we use or put on the land ends up in the water at some point. So these are, I hope resonated with you all as much as it did for us. 
Um, and lastly, we're open for questions. If you would like to contact us, here's our emails. Uh, we also have a brand new website. It is up now, but still pretty new. We just acquired that domain. Um, if you want to see most of our content, you can check our social media out at Sustainable Pharmacy Project. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you all so much. This is a um, really fantastic presentation. Um, I know I learned a lot and hope others did it well as well. Um, I see we already have a lot of great questions in the Q&A uh, box that we'll get to in just a second. Um, but I just wanted to share a couple of advocacy opportunities um, with all of you. Um, sorry, my slides are not advancing here. Um, there we go. Um, there are a couple of QR codes here if you're interested in short links. But we just wanted to make you aware that um, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, we strongly encourage you to join and sign up for our uh, newsletter on our website, virginiaclinicians.org. You can click join. Um, we have an upcoming onboarding session where we're going to talk about the organization's work, um, kind of introduce you and introduce you to some uh, leadership opportunities and leadership development opportunities in the climate and health space. Uh, that's coming up March 1st at 7 p.m. Um, our primary action that we're promoting right now is a call to action on climate, health, and equity. It's pretty broad and includes a range of policies that we'd like to see our elected officials take to make climate, health, and equity um, higher priorities in the legislative and policy decisions that they're making. And then last of all, on our website, there are a host of other resources, but we are always happy to provide one-on-one -on -one support and guidance, um, you know, finding, finding the right resource for you to help elevate your experience working in this space. Um, next, before we open it up for the q and I just wanted to point out that this uh, webinar is eligible for CME credits for those interested. Um, you'll all, all participants will receive a link tomorrow um, after the fact uh, with a link to these resources as well. But if you're interested in applying CME credit for this webinar, um, you can check out those links here. And now we'll open it up for questions. Um, we've already got several, please continue to, to keep them coming in. And we've got about 15 minutes to get through these. So I will turn it back over to y'all to determine who's best suited to answer these questions. Yeah, um, I'm going to start with, um, we got a question that is human excretion thought to be the source of chemicals causing intersex fish in the Potomac and what about meds in animals? Um, so that is um, human excretion of particularly like steroids. A lot of them are excreted unchanged. And so that led, leads to the water once it gets, um, once it leaves the sewer system. And because we don't have the sensitive enough water treatment like tools and technologies to get rid of it. Most of the time it does come out of the major um, like outflows from these water treatment plants into regular surface water. And so um, things like furosemide, that's an endocrine disrupting drug. A lot of the synthetic estrogens used in birth control are also, um, those get excreted unchanged as well. There's a lot of, um, because fish are have such small, um, circulatory systems, it's really hard to predict what happens when they get exposed. Same thing with animals, a lot of pet and veterinary drugs, those are most, most of them are also excreted unchanged. And then, yeah. And then I'll also answer the question about um, what chemical moieties are created in, by burning medications. Um, so incineration is the best method. And also, I guess I can answer a second one too. If meds are returned to the pharmacy, what happens to them from there? So they're usually incinerated. And so this process of burning the medications is thought to have diminished the activity of the, pharmace the pharmaceutical activity as a whole. And because that's the best method they have right now, that's what they're gonna to continue to do. And even though they did research whether it impacts air quality, they found minimal effects. Um, between that, and so they're going to continue to do it. Um, it was an EPA-sponsored study as well. I can answer the one about. There's a question that says, "Do you all reckon there is a there's a precedent for medication recycling in the future for people 
who otherwise couldn't afford necessary medications giving san given sanitation could be guaranteed. I did read briefly in one of the studies that um, oftentimes there are uh, medications uh, rerouted to um, nonprofit organizations or you know certain groups that are serving um, communities that you know can't afford medications such as free clinics. I think it's probably you know a very small portion of medications and probably ones that are just like unopened, maybe have never even left the pharmacy. I think it's a really tri tricky topic because you can't you can't um, 100 percent guarantee you know the safety of medication once it's in someone's home. You don't know how they've been storing it. If it's in a separate bottle, you know you run down this rabbit hole of uncertainty. But you know my hopes would be that is there can be you know. Um, partnerships established with some of these organizations that, you know, do rely on donations, whether it's extending the um, shelf life of medications or having excess stockpile or, you know, I hope we can um, create some kind of rerouting of these medications versus it just going to waste. So kind of tricky because of patient safety, but I think there is room for that to happen for sure. I just want to piggyback really quick on Kelly's response. Um, I attended Clean Med and they actually, I think it was a Dutch program called PharmaSwap, where if there's something going expired or they get something, um, a pharmacy gets something, they can be connected to another pharmacy who has an active prescription for that and they can reroute it to that pharmacy rather than um, disposing of it, which is cool. That's awesome. Okay, I think I can take the last question from uh, pediatrician, I'll read it out. I'm a pediatrician and we recently surveyed patients and 12% reported reusing leftover antibiotics, particularly amoxicillin. Is the amount prescribed actually given to the family or do you give extra liquid amoxicillin? Well, usually, at least um, from my experience working in community pharmacy, um, all of the, we didn't do any compounding. So all the amoxicillin came in a stock bottle that the pharmacist would have to reconstitute. And those are in fixed volumes and liquids our volumes, like amounts of like say 50 milliliters. I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head what it really was. Um, and say the child needed 40 milliliters to last for like four days. Um, but you can't really give them, you can't pour out the suspension into like a smaller bottle and just give it to them. You have to put it in the stock bottle. So they're going to be left with the excess amount. Um, and usually with reusing the leftover antibiotics, especially with like for pedi uh, pediatrics that have to be reconstituted, those only last for at most two weeks. Um, so basically most of the time, unless like it perfectly, in the case that it's like perfectly matching to the stock bottle, the pharmacist will usually give more in those cases, unless it's like a compounding pharmacy, but usually in like a community pharmacy, you're gonna give extra of the uh, liquid antibiotics. Just to add on to that, I know I've, I also work in community pharmacy and I've gotten calls of just patients asking, can I take this old antibiotic? I'm not feeling well. And, you know, as healthcare providers, just educating them, you know, an antibiotic isn't always the answer. I know a lot of times if a child isn't feeling well or, you know, someone's not feeling well, they think that's kind of the, the cure for everything. So, you know, educating patients and letting them know that, you know, there are other over-the-counter medications that can be taken, even a simple as you know, Advil or ibuprofen um, that can help versus turning directly to an antibiotic. So I think again, it's like motivating patients and with that empowerment of, you know, antibiotics are, you know, end up in the environment and there can be, um, you know, foreseen impacts if you decide to, you know, keep, keep it or to um, reuse it. So I think we just need to educate our patients about that on um, both ends. So, um... I'll go ahead and answer Victoria Liu's question. I know that a lot of patients get a better price when they get a large amount, especially for life-saving drugs like blood, blood thinners and et cetera. Is there a way we could address that to help the pill burden? Um, so yeah, kind of like you stated, Victoria, um, normally when you buy in bulk, um, the, the price is going to be less. But um, so for a lot of patients, however, like mainly uh, patients and other pa panelists can kind of back me up or on this, but um, patients prescribed on blood thinners, um, many of them are on Medicare and normally they will get a 90 day supply through that. Um, otherwise it's normally 
um, normally a 30 day supply for, for most, um, patients. Um, that being said, uh, the pill burden kind of falls more on, um, what other medications they're also taking. So if they're taking a blood thinner there, there's a pretty good chance that they're also on several other medications at the same time. And that's kind of where the pill burden comes in. Um, so I kind of wanted to then almost tie in, um, Mr. Paulson's question on should meds be distributed in blister packs rather than bottles. So a lot of um, something that could help patients with pill burden and more with adherence would definitely be blister packs rather than bottles. Um, but a lot of blister packs are used more in mail order pharmacy than um, normal retail pharmacy right now. Um, and they do get rerouted if unused um, and then um, those drugs are either um, reused in other prescriptions or eventually disposed of later. Um, so, yeah. Unfortunately, too, once you take a medication out of its original packaging or break the packaging, the shelf life um, will go down. So once they're in blister packs, typically... Um, they won't be um, as stable as long as if they're in the original packaging. So that could be another concern. Also, just a note to add on with the uh, medications for such as blood thinners. I know a lot of patients that are on Medicare do face really high prices with the new blood thinners. Um, patients paying, you know, up to $400 a month just for, you know, one month's worth of medication. So on the other hand, you have to think about insurance and costs and Unfortunately, all these other barriers, so it does get um, relatively tricky. Um, I'm gonna like address the question. Um, we talked about disposal of meds. How much do we know about waste during manufacture of meds and about chemical waste and energy use? Um, so a lot of pharmaceutical companies, um, particularly Gilead that I know of and AstraZeneca, um, they have released some sustainability information on their websites where you can like click it and it tells you kind of like the carbon um, emissions and these types of things and they update those pretty regularly um, and so I think we're moving in that direction but that's still mostly about their energy use and their carbon footprint but once they're once their medication is produced and into the environment, they don't necessarily continue to track that. They test enough to get FDA approval um, because all medications are required to do an environmental assessment. However, like we talked about, the assessment that they do does not necessarily reflect what's actually in the environment because in the environment, we have very low concentrations for very long periods of time. And they won't, um, it's very hard to mimic that in, an, in a laboratory setting. Um, so yeah, a lot of their websites now are considering putting up that information. Um, Tristan is asking, y'all have mentioned the different systems levers at play in looking to address this problem. Um, if an organization or individual outside of the world of medicine is seeking to invest their resources into addressing issues of medication disposal practices in the immediate future, which of these levers should they prioritize in thinking about where to invest their time, energy, and resources. And Tristan, I think all of us are going to have a little different of an answer for you. I personally believe that education is where um, we should invest our interest. Um, I'm sure that um, someone like Ladon would um, focus more on governmental policy. Um, and there, there are so many, but for me, it's definitely education. And if other panelists want to speak to, to their opinions, um, please do. But I just feel like so many people don't know enough about not only drug disposal, but just about um, proper recycling, um, proper, reu proper reuse, um, things that um, are talked about a lot, but there, there's, there either is no access to the resources um, because of, you know, just not being able to, not knowing about it, um, or they just have never, nobody talks about it. So, um, I know, Tristan, that you're an educator yourself, so um, it, it starts, it starts with, with all of us. It starts with patients, honestly, um, and for providers and 
um, pharmacists, we can, we can do as much as we can um, to educate our patients um, and providers and pharmacists on the call. Um, obviously, I, I'm sure that, in, that you guys will incorporate this in, in your counseling and in your talks with patients, but, but also patient to patient, um, that, that interaction is also just so important. So education for me. I think for me, you know, education is so important. I think looking outside of healthcare, you know, I think infrastructure is a huge problem and even simple um, recycling. You know, we live in the city of Richmond, uh, several of us do, and recycling is very new here. And in fact, my building does not recycle. So personally, I reroute that and take that somewhere else to dispose of, but I know I'm probably the only one my building that does so. So I would love to see um, just the infrastructure set up for recycling and recycling medication specifically. How do you handle that? You know, is recycling um, inhalers different than recycling bottles? Even in community pharmacies, I know I work for a chain community pharmacy right now. And um, when I, what, I spent a summer in Vermont and up there, they recycle their bottles and down here, I've never seen them recycle any um, stock bottles. We get really big stock bottles of certain medications and you know they're huge, they're, they're like um, 500 pills and we throw all of it away. And so how can we you know, work to incorporate that um, in community pharmacies, just as simple as that. And so I would love to see an improvement in infrastructure so we can support the um, initiative once we educate um, people on how to, you know, prevent this medication waste. Thank you all so much. I think that uh, we're close to time here and I'll invite uh, Sam back on to close us out. Well, I just want to thank you all so much. I, I'm so inspired to hear that, uh, that young pharmacy students are considering this and uh, thinking about the full cycle of medications uh, and medication waste. Um, just the concept of, uh, of broadening the perspective, taking it beyond just dispensing the medicine and thinking about what happens to it when the medicine is finished seems so, so fundamental, so simple and yet uh, novel. <laughs> so um, I just really appreciate uh, the work you're doing and I'm really excited to follow you all and um, as the new innovators, right, uh, in this field. So thank you so much for sharing uh, today and teaching us and, about, and uh, inspiring us. And thank you all for joining us, uh, everyone who was able to tune in. And um, we hope to, that you'll uh, join VCCA as well and we'll be continuing to work with the, uh, with the Sustainable Pharmacy Project in the future. So thank you all and have a good day.